And joining me today is uh, a good friend and, of course, BAFTA award-winning television presenter and radio presenter, Gail Porter. Gail, hello. Hey, hi, How are you? I'm fine, thank you. It's lovely to see you again. Do you know what? I, I, want, I want to start this by saying this has taken how long to get started, <laughs> roughly? Forever. Okay, so, yeah, no, that's a definitely a great day. And then something comes up. I was just saying to you earlier, like, my diary, it's either, like, there's nothing. So I think from in about three weeks time it's like it's a vast wasteland of nothingness and so I'm panicking and then everybody wants to do all the same things at the same time and when it comes to you know yeah running around and so I literally was on the, like messaged you and I said are you free now like had half an hour and here we are we did it and I'm, re- I'm really glad because you know what sometimes we, we ch- I mean we've chatted for t- like for ages and some of our best conversations have normally happened about half 11 at night time where we've just sat there and talked endlessly about everything. So I kind of I kind of want to do that today as well. But in a way, like I've listened to so many different interviews with you and they're all great. They're all amazing. But the, the one thing I, I always pick up on and you picked up on it as well is when people interview you, what often happens is they do this whole So this is Gail Porter and Gail's got bipolar and she's got insomnia and she's got mental health issues and she's this, she's that, she's the other. And you kind of go into it as, I mean, as a human being, I mean, I know people see you as a a television presenter and a celebrity, et cetera, but the the point is, is you're a human. How does it feel when you do go into interviews and they kind of just come out with this? Well, do you know, it's because we, we had this conversation before and, and I'll tell you something that's happened this week, which has just really hacked me off. But um, I don't mind it because obviously people, you know, that's unfortunately people highlight, especially media, newspapers, things like that. If something bad happens, they love it. And they love that, you know, I'll speak out about being bald or I'll speak out about having, you know, mental health issues I don't know what label I did a documentary I had five different labels for, from five doctors that met me within 15 minutes each no, didn't know them all and I got all these labels and I was like I don't want them but anyway they just seem to pick up on these and don't go oh, actually do you know what in you know did loads of these things and work for all these amazing charities and she's got a gorgeous daughter and they go hey let's look at all the really shit things that happened to Gail and we'll just put them all together and forget that she's been on the telly books for the past 25 26 years and we'll just do that like really shit period so <laughs> it's totally fine and I'm more than happy to talk about it but what was going to tell you about this thing that happened which I'm sure most people have heard about now but um the Oscars yes. so so the Will Smith thing so I've refused point blank from from eight o'clock in the morning after, after the Oscars my phone was it was emails phone calls did it and it was BBC ITV channel four channel five BBC radio this radio that radio can Gail please make a comment I, I was like because just because I'm completely bold, um, I'm not. I, I don't know this. I don't condone violence. I'm not talking about anything. It's got nothing to do with me. There's obviously something much deeper that's going on there because it was all very weird. And mm-hmm. don't just pick me as the token bald woman from Scotland to just chat about. I'm not. It's nothing. I don't know. I said. So I just switched my phone off and went for a massage. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? The the thing I really love about you is the fact that okay, I know people kind of anticipate and expect you to talk about alopecia. Because it's like it's almost like the elephant in the room. It's like, of course, she's going to talk about it. But yeah, the, I don't the mind lovely, it. But the lovely bit. thing about you, I I saw the well, you we were having a conversation the other day, and you were talking about how you got stopped by this guy on a bike. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to tell it? Because I I just thought it was it was such a sweet story. Oh, the, the guy that was um with his his cousin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm going along. I was trying to cross the road to get on Green Park Tube. And sorry, my cat wants to get involved. Pickles, awesome. can you come away? So I she always she loves she loves this, don't you? She loves the limelight, clearly. She loves the limelight. She's like, sorry, stop talking, mummy. Um <laughs> so stop looking at me, you freak. Um <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm trying to go over to Green Park. And so I'm standing outside the Ritz. I wasn't in the Ritz. I'm not that posh. I was just crossing the road there. I'd been in Green Park, but I wanted to go to the other side of the road to go to Marks and Spencer's. That's a, way too much information. But anyway, this guy stops on the bike. And, of course, I've got my glasses on. But I didn't have my glasses on then. I thought, oh, my God, I've, I've stood out. Or did I move? Or did he think he was going to knock me over? And he's shaking like crazy. And I thought, I've definitely done something wrong. But it turned out that his cousin has got alopecia and she 
has never met anybody else with no hair and he was like oh my gosh she loves you and oh and he was just shaking like that and I was going oh, I, I haven't done anything I went I'm so nervous I don't know what to do and I went honestly I'm not that scary it's not that bad but um so we all exchanged numbers and we're meeting up next week so I'm getting to meet up with her cousin who's never met another bald lady before so that's things really like awesome. I love like that. That are really nice as well. So I do appreciate when people stop or, you know, I used to, I, I, there's so many people that will stop me in the street that go, do you know, I've got this or I've got that and they've hidden it, but they'll chat away to me. So yeah, I love it. It doesn't matter. But the only thing that got me was that when that person, in fact, it happened to me again the other day there that this man said, oh, you've not brought out any music for ages. And I was like, I don't know what's happening here. I said, I can't sing. And he went, oh, you've got a beautiful voice. And then I was thinking, oh, he thinks I'm Sinead O'Connor. And I was like, <laughs> oh. Um. And then when I, when I started stuttering, he suddenly went, oh yeah, and TV, and TV. So obviously his brain had just gone, oh, shit, I've got the wrong person. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going sing for you mate but i think you got the wrong person <laughs> you know, it's, it's always like... nice to be recognized for your you know for your television appearances i actually want to uh, what i want to talk to you about is so last year if, if i'm right in thinking you won the bafta for the program that you did on mental health what yes. led you to make the program initially do you know i can't quite remember i think I worked with BBC Scotland a lot and I know a lot of people from there from when I used to um do children's telly and we've all kept in touch and we're always banging ideas across and I think somebody contacted me I can't remember exactly who it was and they just said you know we're interested in doing this uh, you know do you know what there's so many people contact you with ideas I just go yeah 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 but this one I thought oh I don't know about that that's quite you know they're like well oh, we'll be filming it's three months and we'll film your life and da, 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 and a bit of your history I was thinking, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, it can't be that bad. And then when you actually relive it, I was like, God, I actually did do quite a lot. Of, yeah. Was it through... was it difficult for you to film? Yeah, it was really difficult. Some of it was great because I got to go home um, to Edinburgh and then also, you know, filming it in London. I, I talked to everybody, you know me. So it was nice to see people. But then when I went back to places, like for anyone that doesn't know, I got sectioned 11 years ago or something and so they took me back to the place where I was sectioned in London where I was actually and it's all been knocked down now but you know going back there and having sort of flashbacks of being locked up with no you know no doctors to look after you literally you were just locked up with security guards with a whole bunch of people that had all kinds of different mental health illnesses and then uh, so that that was hard and then going down to sort of it's weird because my dad's in the documentary and he, he passed away at the beginning of lockdown. So I I, I only ever kind of watched it when um, I had to do the voiceover. So um, then I just don't want to watch it. I'll probably watch it one day, but it's a bit, I don't like watching myself. So, and I don't like listening to myself. So, Was there sorry. a way that you could defragment after? Because obviously you're dealing with some really deeply personal issues and, and it's not like you can just go cut and then walk off and everything's fine. That they will be triggering in some way. So was there a way that you could sort of step away from it and go, okay, actually, you know what? Today's been too much and I need to step back from this. Yeah, there was a couple of times um, that I clashed with the director. I mean, we get on fine, but when it's not somebody else's story, it's like, you know, me coming into your life and saying, right, let's go back to that day that was a terrible day for you. And then you'll chat, chat, chat. And then I'll go, actually, could you just do that again from a different angle? You think, you know, it's not, it's not a film. This is real life. So um, it was difficult and that sort of things. And then sometimes I was just like, do you know what? I'm, I'm done. But it was very difficult because we were in different locations. So it wasn't, and we were all staying in the same hotels. So it wasn't, you know, that you could actually get a break at any point. But when I was staying in Edinburgh, I got to see, you know, hang out with my friends of an evening. But we were, the filming was so long. It was very long days. So you wanted to go and see your friends, but also you're extremely exhausted. So, um yeah, just did the usual thing that people do, just kind of like either sit in my room and have a drink or, I don't know, phone a friend or sleep and then wait till I come home. And when I actually got home, just had a couple of days chilling out, me, the cat, went to see friends, didn't discuss it in London because they're not bothered what I do <laughs> from day to day. And I caught up with all the local gossip. So that was great, not to talk about how mad my life was for a, for a was, long was, time. Was there any part of that that was cathartic? In the filming, <laughs> uh, <laughs> mm, 
I don't know. Well, it looks because I mean, it looks like when you watch the documentary, it, it looks like some pretty heavy hitting stuff. I mean, it's not stuff that everybody will necessarily go through, but some portion will identify with it at least. Yeah, so, I think that. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say. So, in that, when you come away from it, is there any part of you that can come away from it and go, "I'm really glad that I spoke about that because it's made me feel lighter in some way, or it's made me feel I, I've got a different perspective on it." I don't think so, you know, because we sort of went backwards. So I'd moved forward by then, you know, I'm, I've got my little flat. I'm happy as anything. I mean, I don't own it, but I rent it, but I've got a roof over my head. So I was, I was in quite a good place. So I went back and dealt with everything, but I think I'd already dealt with most of it. And that's why they thought it was time that perhaps we could go back and talk about it again. But I don't think I learned very much. You know, my dad, I sat down with him and I said, you know, dad, we want to do a quick interview with you in a coffee shop. He's like, no, local pub. I was like, yep, that's my dad. Nothing changes there. And then I said, look, I'm sorry if I let you down because he was talking about, you know, me moving to London and doing this and doing that. And I said, sorry if I let you down, dad. And he went, no, you just let yourself down. I went, there we go. <laughs> no matter how old I get, it's going to be no. the same old. It's all my fault. So, yeah, and I kind of looked back on it and thought, I felt bad at certain points that people realized I had problems, but they didn't know how to talk to me about it. Um, and I didn't know half of some of them knew. I thought I'd covered most things pretty well, but they just said, oh, we just didn't talk about it because you know, either I was working or if we were together, everyone was out on a good fun time out and didn't bring things up to upset anybody. So that was so, quite upsetting. So it wasn't really cathartic. I was kind of angry with myself that I'd let people down. So in the earlier days when you were sort of doing more sort of more television work and you were presenting and it was very much, like I say, very much in the 90s where... You know, it was the modeling, the FHM, the presenting side of things where, you know, you were very, very well known on television all the time. People kind of looking at you from an external perspective, thinking, you know, she's gorgeous, she's pint size, she's this beauty, she's on TV, she's really successful. But then the other side of it is when you come home at night, when you come away from the studio, it's not like that. Well, no, I think, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people go through this just... But I think it's it's heightened when you're um, working in I don't know, films or TV or something like that because we were doing things like Top of the Pops and there was a audience and all the kids and it was hustle bustle and exciting, exciting, exciting. And with someone like me, I'm either high as a kite, you know, not off my face high as a kite, but like my emotions are really hyper. And then suddenly you've got, you know, you've got all these people and then the lights and exciting and you're doing live stuff and there's music and you've got the big crew around you and everyone's a huge family. And then suddenly you've got the car at the end of the night to take you home and you get home and you sit in your own and you think, I don't know what's happened. I don't like this anymore. And then you hit a massive donor. But I was lucky enough to be doing the big breakfast as well. So I didn't really have much time. I was sort of get home, have a cry, try and sleep, get up. And then it was all happy again. So I was kind of, oh, it was quite exhausting. But I was did, young. So Did you know in those times that you were bipolar? Did you, did no. you understand it then? So you didn't? Okay. I, knew, I knew something was wrong from when I was a teenager because I'd – you know, someone could say something nice to me and I was, I wasn't just normally happy. I was ecstatic happy. And then somebody could just say something that they might not even realize that has hurt my feelings. And that'll be me for a couple of days. And I'll be overthinking it and then I'll stop eating or I'll overeat or I won't leave the house or I won't open the curtains. I won't get out of my bed unless I have to. And then I'll get up and get out of my bed and then do the, hi. <laughs> so what was the point for you where you had that moment where you thought hold on a moment there's something not right here do you know what there was quite a few times just to, usually when I didn't when I wasn't working if I had a break from work I couldn't really cope and so and then I'd get really down and I remember going to doctors so many times I don't go to doctors now at all. There's no point. And um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say that to everybody or anybody that's listening because, you know, everyone's you different. You can go to the doctors. Yeah. You can go to the doctors. But when it comes to mental health, yeah, you have to per persevere. That's what I'd say. You have to persevere. Because I went and I was like, I really need to talk to somebody. Uh, no, sorry, can't help you, can't help you. This is this is a long time ago, folks. So, yeah, I'm sure did, it's all Did changed. anyone, like, on set or, like, if you were on television, did anyone kind of go, are you okay? No one. Uh, not really, because it was just buzz, 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 buzz. And no one really talked about it in those days. It was kind of, 
yeah, it was it was not like nowadays that you know people have got departments keeping an eye on mental health. I do talks all over the place um, with different, whether it's banks, lawyers, accountants, I get called in and it's great. And you just think, you know, we all need to talk about it and uh, make sure that everyone's fine. But sometimes it's easier to just, I think when we were having so much fun, we don't want to bring a downer on anything by going, do you think she's all right? You know, Um, but um, yeah, where did I dig- digress? So anyway, yes. So yes, do go to the doctors. But in my day, I went and went and then went. And eventually I went down and I broke down in tears. And I said to the receptionist, I actually got on my knees and I was like, I need help. I need someone to talk to. And then she just went through the thing. She's like, so what are you doing three weeks on Thursday or whatever it was? And I was like, now someone needs to talk to me. And um, I just went, oh, do you know what? That's it. I'm done. I'm out. And uh, went home and probably drank a bottle of wine and self-harmed or something really productive. So <laughs> I look back and think, what was I thinking of? But then I've actually, I got to um, chat to the Samaritans a few times. Now, that's a good one because they don't ask you any questions. You don't have to tell them your name. You could just talk and talk and they listen. And sometimes that's what you need. And well, also- I was going to say, was that a relief for you? Because, I mean, it's I, I guess it's hard enough if you are doing a regular job, et cetera, but if you're doing the job that you're doing where you're known, your face is known, everybody knows who you are, and then you suddenly call up the Samaritans and be like, hi, I'm Gail Porter, then suddenly you've got like press, et cetera. So, yeah, you just worry. And it was those times as well because there was lots of stories in the papers about everybody. And, I mean, I'm Z-list, and there were still stories about where I'd been or you know my mum was was ill with cancer and they knew where I it was just weird things so I started to shut down because I thought right I can't think it's one of my friends surely it can't be one of my friends but it was really personal stuff and so I started to not tell anybody anything and then the stories went down so I was thinking who is this and this went on for ages and it wasn't till not that long ago I found out I was one of the people that had my phone hacked so not only are you paranoid and trying to get help anyway and then now you're thinking I can't tell my friends anything because someone is telling something to somebody for it to be in the papers how do they know where I am so I felt really bad. So once I found out my phone was hacked, I just went round and I said to all my friends, I'm sorry. And they went, what for? And I said, well, I just shut up for a while. And they said, we wondered, you were very quiet. And I said, I, I knew it couldn't have been one of you, but I just didn't know what was going on. It was really confusing for me. Because you never think for a second that someone's going to tap your phone. So you were being, you, your phone something. was being tapped. Yeah. The press were essentially being given a, a hotline to every Where aspect of your what, life that was going on if i'm sad Even if I'm the, happy. the darker points of your life as in, in terms of like your mum's illness etc how do you process that well i didn't obviously know about it until i went into this lawyer's office they contacted me and they said we need you to come in and then there was just files and files and files on this huge table and there's like six people sitting around the table and they said this these are these are your conversations and these are um these are stuff that was in the paper and you, you've been hacked. So we need to take it from here. So I just burst into tears and I said, I need to go outside. And I went outside and I was thinking that you've got to be kidding me. And I couldn't, I couldn't process it at all. And they said, right, they want to settle with you. No court, no nothing. And I was like, I, oh man, I just didn't know how to deal with it. I said, you deal with it. I can't cope with this. I really can't cope. And then I think I went to the pub. And you went to the pub. I think so. I went for a glass of wine and thought, right, okay. And then uh, got the evening standard and went home and cried. <laughs> and let but them what, do I mean, now, what essentially, what safeguards can you put in place to prevent stuff like this? Because it, it sounds like espionage when you think about it. But, you know, if you, if you are doing this type of role, what do you do to prevent stuff like that? Because you are very open. Like, you're a very open person. Like, we've, we've been out. I mean, the first, the first time I ever met you, uh, we were doing Matthew Wright's uh, right, radio yeah. show, and uh, I came in, and I didn't. I'd, I'd never met you before in my life, and you were probably one of the most friendliest people I'd ever met. And I remember going home and speaking to my other half, and going, I "Just met Gail Porter. She's really cool." And then after that, we just became really good friends. But the lovely thing about you is because you're so open. There's a good side to that, which is you're very open, you're very loving, you're very giving, 
But then the other side of that is that's a super easy thing for people to kind of go, I'm going to take advantage of this. Yeah, I think, but I think now that after the whole, um, that's very kind of you to say, but you're super easy. We had a great time at Pride, we did. didn't we? Yeah, we really <laughs> did. So, so for the benefit of people listening, I invited Gail along to London Pride and I was like, oh, she's probably going to be too busy. She's not going to be able to make it. And I Gail was like, Pride. I'm there. And and that was it. And Gail was the life and soul of the party. I think well, you we- shook hands with pretty much every single person that came across you. It was awesome. Oh, it was so much fun. But then it's when we got down to Soho. This happens to me every year. Obviously, it's yeah. not been happening the past couple of years. But every year, by the time we get to Soho, because I'm only five foot one or two, <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's really tall and then I get kind of like oh I need to get out so I never kind of make it down to uh, you know the big party at the end because I can't see and I get really kind of squashed and everything so I kind of just head to balance and they always put me at the back and they went there's Gail she's got popping at the back she'll be fine but yeah no I love it so much I really really enjoy it but you've you've got involved in a lot of charity work generally yeah haven't you as much yeah. as I possibly can what well, is is this something that is something that's really important to you? It just puts it just makes me happy and seeing other people happy and I just think, you know, um if you're in a position I mean we we always did stuff even when we were kids, you know. Um mum encouraged us to do whatever we fancy doing if we wanted to help or we went to fundraise by selling our toys in the front garden or you know, even if it's like we made 5 pounds we'd take it to whatever charity. Yeah. And um yeah, as soon as you get offered, I mean, sometimes it overwhelms me a little bit because you get email after email after email. And I've been caught up quite a lot when it's cost me money to go and do something. And I've ended up like 200 quid out of pocket because I go, oh, sorry, we can't. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, no, yeah, no, it's fine. I'll do that. No, it's fine. <laughs> My daughter sometimes says, Mom, I really need to be your manager. You've got to stop saying yes to everything for yeah. free. No, that's but true. I, I do enjoy it. And also, I just. I mean, just getting to meet people and trying to just make a difference or even if it's just on social media, if someone says, look, could you post that on social media for us? That's obviously easy as anything. But actually getting out and doing things, you know, which obviously we couldn't do um, over COVID. But I did get to do lots of stuff online, which was great, uh, raising money. So, yeah, whatever. whatever and attending I... quizzes as well, Gail. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. I enjoyed the quizzes. <laughs> missed the quizzes mind you it was going to the stage wasn't it because like everyone started doing quizzes I think then... it, was, it was doing quizzes and it was um, baking banana bread there was like a staple yeah, that people did over lockdown I can't even switch my oven on so no. <laughs> I don't cook at all nothing I want to check in with you though because I promised that I would do this um, um, during during any interview I prom- and I promised you I would do this I also promised anyone I interview that I'll do this to check in with you to see how you are at the moment. So how are you? Today, I am good, yeah. I've been really tired, but um, I think I've, I'm just not sleeping brilliantly because um, I go to bed and then I'll think about something and then I, I'll, I'll keep myself, you know when you just think and then you overthink and then I think, oh, I'll pop the telly on, maybe that'll, and then I watch something and I tend to watch a series and I think, oh, I need to watch the next one. So that's not, it's my fault. And then I'll think, oh, I'll just check, see who else is are up. Are you a binger? Or... Yeah. You are a binger. Yeah. I'm a binger. Me too. So I'm a bit kind of worried because Ozark's coming back at, at the end of April. Nice. So I'm going to have to write off a couple of nights. <laughs> <laughs> if, I can, if I can do it one night, that'd be great. But I'm going to have to do it. I binge everything. Are you a binger? I, I'm a massive binger, but I, 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 I kind of am a fibber binger as well because what I do is I say to people, "Oh no, I've only seen the first episode, and I've actually seen like two series." So, oh no, I can't wait. I go, "Have you got to the end yet?" And they went, "Gail, it started last night." I went, "I know." <laughs> they went, "It's nine a.m." I went, "I know." Did the lot everything. So, what are you watching at the moment? At the moment, I've actually just gone back to The Sopranos just for a bit of light relief with what's going on in the world. Sopranos, like, kind of, light relief. <laughs> light relief watching Tony. Tony. And I just think, you know, it's much nicer watching all that madness than what's actually going on in this world, you know. I'd rather watch pretend violence on the telly than um, than actually watching the news. How That's were you over COVID anyway? How were you during the lockdowns? Well, um, uh, but first, how are you? I'm I'm great. I'm 
I, I am genuinely very great. The reason why I'm smiling quite a lot is because, I mean, and you'll know this, like, so I, uh, our scale ages ago, I think actually before lockdowns, possibly, like, we should do a podcast. We should do an interview. Yeah. And Gail was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just let me know when. It's like every day I came to Gail was like, yeah, that's awesome. And then literally like two days before Gail was like, I can't do it because I've got to do this and I have to go here. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Just let me know. And then the, well, it just kept like, going on and on. So the fact that you're here is just is, incredible. <laughs> is, well, we had two years in our sort of industry not getting paid or yeah. doing it. So, um, no, no offense, but if someone suddenly comes to me and goes, We've got a paid job, but I'm, I'm taking it. I as understand. long as I agree with it and it's not a really rubbish job. But if it comes up, they say, Do you know what? It might just be this. And I'm just like, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to, it, we've all got rent to pay or mortgages or whatever. So, but you, yeah. You did a job recently and it didn't go exactly to plan. Like, so it was, uh, if I'm right in remembering this, you did a haunted. Uh, TV show for Discovery was it? Yeah, it's coming out in June. In June, and as a result of doing it, you managed to end up with a skull fracture. Yeah, well, that wasn't kind of that wasn't filming it. It was actually after filming it. But um, yeah, we were filming up in Scotland. I mean, it was great fun, and it was an amazing crew and everything. And it's coming, yeah, coming out in June. It's called Spook Scotland. It's going to be on Discovery and Discovery Worldwide, which is exciting. But um, I'm a really fussy eater, and I don't eat meat. And everybody else, I think, ate meat. And so I was kind of. It was freezing cold. Who films in Scotland at winter? We do. <laughs> um, so in haunted houses with no heating and stuff. So. Um, yeah, I kind of was not properly looking after myself and I hadn't eat, eaten properly. And uh, anyway, still, I've got to get some more scans on my head. But um, uh, apparently I was, uh, they'd all gone out for dinner and I'd come down and I was chatting to somebody and they said my eyes just rolled to the back of my head before I sat down for tea. And they said I just fell backwards and I was out for about seven minutes, they said. And then it turned out that I'd fractured my skull and had a bleed, bleed on my brain. And they said it was due to um, low blood sugar. And, um, well, I've got a re- an irregular heartbeat. So I got taken to Glasgow Royal Infirmary eventually. And, uh, yeah, so that was not the best. So I spent Christmas and New Year in my bed on my own. Well, I wasn't. The cat's here. Sorry, Pickles. You were here. Thank you for that. Um but yeah, it was not it was not very well. But we managed to finish filming. We had to put it off for about three weeks so I could recover. And um, yeah, it was it was a pretty pretty big old head injury. <laughs> did you did you actually find any ghosts or pixies? Well, we've had this conversation, but for everybody else, uh, do you know what? There was I'm being polite. <laughs> Where there were certain places that I went that I was refusing point blank to go, you know, I went down to where was it now? Uh, I think it was Bannockburn House, and I went downstairs to the the basement, and then also I went to I think it was Bonnie Prince Charlie's room, and when it got to, so we during the day we do the history of wherever we were, so it was really interesting. So you find out the history and the and you know who'd been living there and the English versus the Scottish and it was great it was good and we had some amazing historians come in and then at night time we'd look for the ghosts <laughs> and um I'm kind of like skeptical and then I was with a psychic um who um I wouldn't name but I've worked with before because I think they do I, a reveal or something I don't know but um anyway and he's really his life is is spirits and fairies and ghosts and uh I, what is he? What is he else? Imps and oh, I can't, I can't keep up. What's with an him. imp? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's like I think it's like a mischievous thing. But every time he oh, went, okay. I think there's an imp in the room. Everyone looked at me, and I was like, it's not me. It's an actual imp. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so at night time, yeah. Then suddenly we'd wait till about maybe ten o'clock at night when it was completely pitch black. I mean, it goes it goes pitch black about three p.m. in Scotland at winter. So I don't know why we had to wait till ten because I think ghosties are around all the time. But then it got to that time, and then we all sort of wandered around on our own, or you'd have one camera person, and then I'd be filming myself, and the other presenter would be downstairs, and somebody else, you know, would be freaking out somewhere. And um, there was a lot of electronic things that could pick up on energy. 
So you could hear them going off in different parts of a castle or a house where nobody was. And then that was scary. I didn't like that. And there was a few times I burst into tears, I must admit, because I was like, the energy would just change in a room. So I didn't see anything. But you felt it? No, I did feel like certain things. And yeah, they were going, Gail, you have to go back down there. And I went, <laughs> I, would, I mean, would you do it again? Well, I think we are. <laughs> I mean, do you remember the days of Derek Okora? Yeah, but he got caught out, didn't he? Well, I mean, it's hard not to when you come out with a line like, Mary loves dick. You know, I mean, yeah. you, you really aren't going to get away with one of those. But, I mean, you, know, you know what the story was. He kind of, they gave him false information and then he managed to read it. They, they did it on purpose. Give false information and he read it. So then like, we're downstairs in the basement or somewhere he's going, oh, da, da, da. And he just basically regurgitated what they'd written, which yeah. was total make-believe. And um, yeah. Anyway, I okay. think that's what happens anyway, allegedly. Allegedly, yeah, we, we should say allegedly. Allegedly. Well, yeah. it, was in the, it was in the paper, so obviously it's true. But no, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, they were weird. There was sort of, but I mean, I did one called Dead Famous and that was weird. We were. Um, I remember Dead Famous. Locked up in Alcatraz overnight. Yeah. And stuff that sounds like pretty that. cool though. It was it was amazing because we were literally looking for dead famous people, and then we were you know we go and interview Marilyn Monroe's hairdresser, and you know it, it got either superbly camp or superbly insane, and then you're in the you know you're in the Hollywood studios, then you're in Alcatraz, then you're in San Francisco looking for Alfred Hitchcock. It was yeah. Wasn't it? Hold on, wasn't it your mum who actually said to you that she she thought you'd lost your hair because of doing that program? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I told her I'd got alopecia, she's like, I, I know why. And I was like, all oh, right, okay. And she's like, you've been messing with the dark side. That's what it is. And I went, mum, ghosts don't cause alopecia. Believe you me, <laughs> it's not the ghosts. It's an actual autoimmune deficiency. She's like, no, it's the ghosts. So, yeah. But that's the, how, the pretty that's powerful how thing of all of this is, though, is that whilst you went through alopecia, you didn't feel the necessity to wear the wig i know you've got one and you've got probably quite a few haven't you but i think i've got a pink one and a purple one and a white one but they're not i've seen seeing the purple one and i you saw seen... the one that you you wore on um i think you wore one on loose women oh yeah that wasn't even mine <laughs> oh it wasn't yours oh okay. no basically um it was a company that wanted to fit it onto me and uh, because um i'd always said i'm not that bothered to be honest and they said oh, wait, would you like to talk to people and just say do you know the you can get it if you want it. But everyone knows that anyway. But I said, yeah, but, you know, if it helps and it encourages people. And it was quite nice. So I had it on for the day and it was kind of nice to do all this and that. And um, so then they said, oh, we're going to take it back, get it all done, and we're going to send it to you. And I thought, how exciting. Um, so I'll have it. So if I feel like being blonde for the day, I could put it on. Never got it. <laughs> Never sent it. So um, I, but I have looked it. at it. I have looked at a wig that I really like, so I thought I might treat myself now that I'm 51. I thought I might just do a, you know, at least you've got an alternative apart from my kind of I'm going to the Admiral Duncan in Soho wearing a purple one or G-A-Y wearing a pink one. I might have one to go flirty, whatever, like that. Because when I first lost my hair, (laughs) um, I was like, every time I went out and chatted to people, Obviously, I was very conscious of it, but I just thought, I, I can't be bothered. So much has happened in my life. A wig is the last thing on my mind. I just need to get over and I just deal with it. Just deal with it and then see if I fancy a wig. But I kept doing this when I was chatting, going, all right. <laughs> I think like I had, all right. I was slicking my hair that I didn't have. But I was just so used to it. You know, you've got like 33 years of clicking your hair and then suddenly it's all gone. But so, with alopecia, it doesn't just affect your head. It affects eyebrows, oh, eyelashes. Yeah. I did I did have eyebrows and eyelashes for a while, but they fell out um, after I fractured my skull. So I don't know if, if that had something, but I've got nothing now at all. Okay. Nothing whatsoever. Which, you know, for ladies from the neck down, fantastic. Yeah. But I really miss the eyebrows and the eyelashes. So tomorrow I'm going to go into MAC. They're really good and they stick the eyelashes on for me because I can't even get... Uh, sometimes you can get lashes that last a few weeks, but they've got nothing to attach them to at all. So you actually glue them onto my lids and I keep them on for a day. <laughs> and then they draw a nice little, because I don't, someone said, oh, do you want to get your eyebrows tattooed on? I don't, no way. Because you see the, uh, no offense to the ladies that have got the really big black ones, but I think I'd be terrified. I'd, I'd rather just do tiny, oh no, it's too much, too much it, for me. 
It's I mean, it, it is it's a lot, but in a way you've been able to make it your own in a way. Well, that's why I kind of like going into Mac or somewhere else or one of my mates because they can draw it on and then they can take it off. But you get something tattooed on, you're screwed, aren't you? Well, yeah, especially if they're like this. Yeah, just... you just look surprised all the time. Yeah. Or, or something like that. Yeah. Or like no, no, no. a cartoon villain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, I just kind of, I do miss them though. I was pretty gutted when they found out. How did you... Just thinking... Sorry, go on. No, no, I was going to say the weirdest thing is the nose hair because obviously nose hair is there for a reason, like your lashes yeah, to keep dust out of your eyes. Nose hair, you know, um, I've, I'm sneezing all the time, wake up, everything, it just affects me. And I have to always have a tissue because if your nose runs, it just, there's nothing to hold it back. True, it's like, yeah. There's nothing, there's no hair whatsoever anywhere. So um, You have to spend longer in, like, in makeup, for example. So, you know, and, and this is something I didn't realise until I worked on the on the Matthew Wright show, but when you when you are on screen, you're shiny. Generally, yeah, they're coming and pat my head now. Yeah, <laughs> Every, I get really jealous, and everyone's getting their hair done, and they just come and give me up. I think sometimes this talk can do it just to make me feel that I'm special. Some I'm, I'm like the same as everybody else. Let's just pat her on the head. She'll be all right. I mean, the thing is, we're making light of it, but there is a serious side of this because oh, yeah. not exactly an easy thing to go through. How how did it affect you? Oh, God. I mean, I still have really bad days. Last week was awful. Last two weekends ago, oh, I, just, I couldn't get out of my bed. I just thought I can't cope with this. But I can. Of course I can. But it's like everything, you know, people feel funny about everything. But I think because it's so visual, and then that's what I think. I wish I had that blonde wig just to shove it on. But, you know, I can put a cap on. I can put a hat on, go up to the shops. But there's sometimes, you know, if I'm going out to meet friends for dinner and they're all turned up and they've all got their hair done and then I do feel a bit weird sometimes and just think, oh, God, why me? I've not had enough going on without this happening. And so it grew back but a little bit and then it fell out again. And I think I'm pretty much done. I mean, I don't shave or anything. There is nothing whatsoever. But, I mean, as I, it's good for showers. So nice it's and quick. Great for showers. And it's, yeah, it used to take me ages. I used to go to the hairdressers because I had so much hair. And now I've got nothing, so it's just in and out. So do you, um, do you feel that in a way though you've also become because of it you've also become much more um, easy to recognise? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. I kind of like do, yeah, because I don't want to keep a hat on all the time. You know, if I'm indoors or I'm in a shop or something, and I'm roasting hot, I just think and I want to take it off, and then you get the odd look from kids or you know younger people will just think and the mums will just go well hey Gail how you doing you just think yeah well there we go or Sinead or whatever but um <laughs> but yeah but it's good as well though because I do lots of great talks with kids and stuff so because kids are so intuitive and they'll just look at you and they don't know who you are what you've done or anything like that and they just go why has this happened what 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 da, 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 da? and then you can just tell them a story i did i was with a whole bunch of kids in leeds a couple of weeks back and they all had different kind of backgrounds and um they were all just asking a million and one questions we're kind of backing off when i first got in and then by the end of it i literally had a new gang of best mates they're good no because we went rock climbing they're going no gail come with us no gail come with us because i was a new friend that looked different so you know and it you know it was nice that they asked questions and stuff because sometimes you know it, teenagers can be a well, little bit i was gonna bit... say teenagers kids normally can be quite cruel yeah, so no. I have had a couple of, you know, if they're old enough and I have had a couple of teenagers that I've just gone, oh, baldy, and I just I would just walk back up and I went, what the F did you say? And then they suddenly just, uh, yeah, they hear the Scottish accent, they see a bald person, they probably think, oh, my God, she's insane. Well, you have a black belt in karate. Two black belts, Chris, come two, on. Two black belts in karate. Two seconds out, one in so karate. somebody must be, in like, kickboxing. crazy to mess with you. And with this ring as well. <laughs> That's a big yeah. ring. <laughs> yeah. I just think, I think, honestly, the Scottish accent terrifies them, I think. Yeah. Although I think, no, I think I think your Scottish accent's quite sweet, to be honest. Do you, kids? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Not when I get really angry, but I don't really get angry because when I go to the kids, I go, what the F in there? And it sounds quite good. And then you turn away going... <laughs> yeah. You know, like that. But I can do the proper straight face and everything. You F in what? And then you walk away going... <laughs> You um you turned, I'm allowed to say it. You turned 51, 51 
Um, how are you feeling now that you're yeah. is it a good is it a good year for you? Do you know I still feel eighteen to be honest with you. I just feel a lot less hairy than when when I was eighteen. But um, yeah, I don't. I honestly don't think I'm fifty fifty one at all. It just seems like I remember when my mum was forty, and I thought that was ancient. And now I'm fifty one. And I got a very cool birthday card from my daughter, which I won't read out because it's very funny, but um, she did make me laugh because she's just, you know, she's 19, she's at uni, so I kind of, like, miss out on the phone calls because she's busy. And then I got the card and it did make me laugh out loud. So apparently she is proud of me. So, But I can't tell you for what reasons, but it's funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to ask. Just Don't ask. ask. <laughs> so yeah. have you got any projects in the pipeline at the moment? Um, I do. What am I doing? Oh, yes. I'm doing some stuff with Steph's Pack Lunch in the next couple of weeks, which should be fun. I won't tell you what it was because I was supposed to be doing it last week and then I was supposed to be doing it this week coming. So it's moved around, but um, if it all comes off, it's going to be very exciting. So I'm waiting to do that. I'm doing quite a lot of talks at the moment, so I'm, I'm hosting a lot of balls. It's Mental Health Awareness Week coming up soon. So I'm going to be doing a lot. Are you are you doing a lot over that? I'm Yeah, I'm going to be doing tons in Mental Health Week. I think, are you, you know Weirdly, though, Mental Health Week is, for, well, for me anyway, it's become Mental Health Month, which has become Mental Health Year, which is just yeah. mental health all the time, really, to be fair. It's like Alopecia Awareness Week, just like it's every day for me, to be honest. Do you, like, but do you ever get, do you ever get tired? Because essentially, when, and we've, we've discussed this as well, whenever you hear an interview, and they're like, we'll be talking to Gail Porter, and then Gail Porter comes on, and, and then normally the presenter's like, you, you've got this you've got that this. you've got this and and gail's just kind of sat there going great yeah oh, and then i went to go and then i went to brighton and then i went on the roller coaster and then um i did sort of really good stuff and then but no they're not bothered no, no. interesting but i've got but, a yeah. nice job with the bbc t- tomorrow um a documentary about top of the pops so i think they're interviewing a whole bunch of musicians and uh, it's my day tomorrow so i'm doing 1999 because you got to work with jimmy savile during that time from... i think i only met him once when yeah. there was a whole bunch of they got a whole bunch of um presenters in so i can't remember exactly who was there but i remember him there because he made me very uncomfortable and um Actually, the weird thing was when we were filming Spooked Scotland, you know, you had that house up in Scotland. Yeah. yeah we drove past it. And I was I was driving. It's the first time I've driven in about seven years. And I'm driving this BMW, massive big thing. And I'm on a tiny wee road up in Glencore or something. And I was like, uh, but luckily it was like, um, you know, automatic. Thank goodness for that. But I took a, a look to the left. I was like, is that Jimmy Savile's house? You could tell because it's had something spray painted on the side of it, which you can imagine. And uh, I was like, oh. So apparently they've sold it. So I don't know who's going to what they're going to do with that. It's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's pretty creepy. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So I mean, I didn't have much to do with him, but he was there once, and he was he was very uncomfortable. And I'm really pleased that when I wrote my two letters to Jim will fix it, he I didn't get picked. I think I actually wrote to Jim will fix it at one point. I'm very write? glad that I didn't get yeah. picked. But you didn't. I mean, like growing up in, in those in that era, you, you didn't know like. He was a TV personality. I think what what kind of gets to me is like the after effects of it, where you now hear the stories where people at the time did know. They knew. I know. That's the scary thing. Yeah. Because you just think, how have these other grown-ups let that happen? And all us kids are just going, yeah, dear Jim, please may I be in Star Wars. Lots of love, Gail. Is that what you wrote? Well, I did that one. And the other one was, do you remember the song, Mirror, Mirror by Dollar? So in the video, right, I, um, I can't remember the name. Was it David Dan, Van Day and somebody else? Yeah. I remember. Okay. Anyway, um, in, the, in the video, which has obviously already been recorded, they're in a window of a toy shop or something. They're going, mirror, mirror, mona, mona. I want it to be in that video. I want it to be shrunk. So then I didn't get picked for that. So what I did was I wrote to the Tooth Fairy and I said, Dear Tooth Fairy, instead of 50p, could I please have a very small person because of a program on the telly called The Land of the Giants? Did you ever watch that? Land of the Giants, tiny no. People. It was like the borrowers, we tiny people. And then they were running around this house and everybody, they weren't giants, they were our size, but there was wee tiny people in the house. They thought they were. And so I just said, could I just have a wee tiny person? Instead of 50p, I'll look after the tiny person very well. I didn't get it. I didn't get a wee tiny person. <laughs> I love it. So, so like I say, apart from Steph's pack lunch, uh, which you can't tell us what you're doing on Steph, Steph's pack lunch. 
But that's that. And I've got, well, um, you know, I've been writing this stupid book. Well, it's not stupid. It's a book for... Well, about, I was about to say, can we mention it? Are we allowed to talk about um, it? I, don't, I, won't, I won't say exactly because it's all still sort of... Yeah, like, I was going to say. Right? It's, it's with a... It's with a film production company at the moment so I'm, I'm doing a few tweaks and alterations at the moment and then yeah they've got a few ideas with what they want to do with it and people are looking at it for doing different things so you know I always I tend to get really overexcited and I shouldn't but I'll see so I've been working on that for I think mean, I've been doing it for years but it's sort of gone from publishers and then publishers say I don't want it and then it's come back and then I've got rid of it and then things have changed and so I rewrite it I just kept going and then giving up then going and then this time it seems to be seems to touch wood it seems to be going all right so that and um what else I, I'm not sure if we're doing another second series of Spook Scotland and then I think I'm off to do one of those body camps, you know, when you go off for a week and just get fit in the sun and write about it. Well, I, I was going to say, you were meant to do... What was I, I was meant to do... Um, yeah, the... Can I say this? I don't know. I don't know. Can you say this? Do you know. to say this? Well, I guess so, because I'm not on it. <laughs> um, I was supposed to be doing SES, but um, it, uh, they changed their minds last sort of a couple of weeks before, a week before. But um, that's all right. I was supposed to be doing the jungle years ago and they let me know about five days before the flight that they didn't want me anymore. <laughs> but if you had the opportunity to do the jungle again, like to do it, would you Would you do it? I wouldn't do it in Wales after doing Spook Scotland. I need some warmth. <laughs> I was like to do it somewhere, you know, a wee bit further away. But yeah, I quite enjoy it. I, I mean, I was so excited to do it the first time. Um, but I mean, that was years and years ago. And then they were a bit worried. I mean, it's weird because we filmed everything. We did all the adverts, we did all the photo shoots, and then uh, about the week before, they just said, oh, no, we're just worried about, you know, the fact that you used to cut yourself. And I went, I just wrote a book about it, yeah. <laughs> which came out about three years ago. So it wasn't like it was a secret. But I don't know. You know, TV folk just decide what TV folk do. Are you, are you all right? Pickles is back. Yeah, Pickles, what's that? Pickles is Pickles awesome. Is What's up? <laughs> She's so weird. Honestly, when I came back from Spook Scotland, I'm sure she thinks there's a ghost in the house. Is there a ghost in the house? <laughs> such a weird Love cat. It. She's suffering from... Um, so when I go out, even if it's the shops, she'll go for my leg. She'll go and scratch me or she'll meow and meow. Is this because separation also, anxiety? Or? I think so. I think because lockdown, I was here 24-7. Yeah. I had COVID twice. I'd gone and picked my dead dead dad up from Spain a week before lockdown. Sorry, Pickles, are we in, are we in your way, my friend? You wanna, come here. Come see here. For the benefit of people listening, um, Sorry. Uh, Gail's <laughs> pussy is currently uh, <laughs> in the way. <laughs> That sounds so wrong, Chris. That's it so really wrong. does. But right, it's Pickles, come here, come here, <laughs> come here. So she's like, she's so like at, the, at the moment, then, like in terms of um, in terms of your your own self, like any any hot dates on the horizon? Oh my god, I know. I can't even remember last time I went on Does a date. Does Gail Porter date? I don't know. I've never. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I don't think um, it's ever going to happen, to be honest. I'm 51, I'm bald, I've got a cat. It's not really like... Yeah, but and you're I'm also 51, I'm hot, and got a cat, so... Uh, definitely not. I've just been doing loads of exercise, and that makes me very happy. But also, I like to do classes, so I've got to be careful, because obviously everything costs loads of money, and you don't know where the next job is coming from. But well, I'm you're right. a soul cycle queen, aren't you? Yeah, I, got, I love soul cycle, but it's quite expensive. But honestly, it's my oh my gosh! It's like it's like a nightclub yeah. on a bike, and the girls are fantastic. The guys are fantastic. Everyone that does it, but uh, I've just signed up for a twenty day course in Bikram. There's a special offer, and it says if you do twenty days in on a on the trot, you get it for forty quid. And I was like, that's not bad actually. It's usually about twenty quid a class. Could you so imagine? exercise has been a saving grace for you in terms of like yeah yeah. Health. I don't take medication or anything like that. No. Um, Which is because, pretty amazing, really. Yeah, well, I tried at the beginning. There were a section. They medicated the health out of me because there was no doctors. So they just, like, they'd give you tablets in the morning, tablets in the afternoon, tablets to make you sleep. And, uh, yeah, it was like being a zombie. It was very weird. So then as soon as I came out, I was like, no, I'll go running. I mean, I do like running, but then I do stop and talk to everybody, so I don't really exercise. But when I'm in a class, I have to, you see. And if it's like... I was at a gym, but I had to stop that as well because I talked to everybody. 
to get anything done. Very so, good. Yeah, I'm just annoying. But the thing is as well, so what I do when I go to the gym or anything, I put my headphones on, but people still come over and chat. And then I can't help myself, so I have to take the headphones off and chat anyway. Yeah, but you will chat. I know you. You will chat to everyone. Yeah, well, that's why I put the headphones on, so it's not my fault. So if they come to me, it's their fault. And they <laughs> I like your logic. Yeah, they start it. <laughs> yeah. So like I say, what is what is next for you, though, in terms of Sorry? in terms of career? What would you genuinely love to have the opportunity to do? Keep writing. But the thing is, I get sort of three quarters of the way through the book that I've been doing and then I get I'm bored of, of myself and I think it's because also I've done that documentary and that was hard enough and then sometimes when I'm writing because it's about what happened and good things and bad things but sometimes I just think oh I've done this to death like god oh. and then I'll send it to somebody and they'll just like we it's funny though and it's weird but because I'm writing it I just think I don't like it so I, what I need is someone to sit with me or to, to go and sit somewhere with someone for an hour and just push me and I know I really enjoy it, but then when I'm sat on my own, I just think, oh, it's rubbish, and then I go to bed and watch a series of something I don't really want to watch, just anything. I'll just go and watch Star Wars again. I I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll make you a deal. If you want to do it, I'll sit with you and write. Okay. All right. Excellent. It sounds quite good. Do fun. it after I've stopped detoxing because that's always funny when you've had a cocktail and then you write. Well, I don't know about you, but if I, I'm doing this intermittent fasting thing at the moment, I've lost weight. I've lost about like a. a yeah, stone you did. You look. You, I mean, you look great. You looked amazing Thank when you. I saw you last week. You look. So, everyone was saying that. But the but, only but thing about like, it is, Luke was saying to me today when I saw him, and he's like, oh, he's so well groomed. He was so well groomed because Luke's got big hair, and he's like, Luke, your friend Chris, he's so well groomed. He looked amazing, and he says, and I've got this massive hair. And I was like, no, everyone looked fantastic. No, I, I, I should, I should tell you, like the night. So. Gay Gail had her birthday drinks, uh, when was it, last week? Yeah, yeah last Wednesday, and, yeah. Uh, it's the only opportunity that I've had in the last two years to wear grown-up clothes because normally I'm dressed in jogging bottoms and that's about it. So it was it was my time to actually get dressed up. And yeah, be you look fancy, great. I just right? rocked up in a pair of dungarees as usual because they're comfy. <laughs> you look great as normal. No, I was knackered, but um, I was so pleased to see everyone because the thing is, I didn't tell everybody. It was all kind of just like, oh, if you want to come, if you want to come. So it was during the week I saw quite a lot of people, and then I did this, yeah, just gone on this juice fast thing. But what's your intermittent fa- intermittent fasting? So is that my like intermittent fasting? fasting? I'm probably not doing it right, so I'm probably going to get somebody to tell me oh, it's wrong now. But, but what don't I do tell is... it off because we do it our way, right? Exactly. So what I normally do is I um will eat between 12 and 8 p.m. in the evening. And okay. after 8 p.m., I won't eat until I normally eat like 12 or 1 o'clock the next day. So I've normally got about 16 hours of fasting where I'm, I'm not I'm not having anything. I drink water. That's fine. And, um, is, and then does that make your body uh, – does it speed your metabolism up or well, something? Uh, well, it, what it's meant to do is it's meant to um, – I don't know if it starts the process of, of autophagy, if I think if, if that's the correct term, where your body essentially – eats um cells that it doesn't need anymore so it, essentially it's like clearing yourself out but i do it as part of i, I still have a, like a calorie controlled diet and that's what i do and it seems to have worked um, yeah you look great yeah I'm, I'm i'm gonna keep on it until like it stops working and then then we'll see <laughs> well, i'm just gonna do i don't know what i'm doing at the moment i've just i know that i've given up everything so <laughs> no, I'm just mostly juices. My friend's got these ginger things. It's really nice. So you put a bit of ginger and hot water in the morning and oh, it's so filling. It's really nice. So that'll do you. And then there's another detox thing, which is like all these lovely vegetable soups, which are quite filling as well. Or I eat fish still. So I don't eat meat, but I eat fish. Or something so you're just... more pescatarian? Yes, pescatarian. Yeah. This, is how, this is how tragic, right? So you say about my love life, there is none, okay? Um, so last night, I got two bits of wee bits of just white cod, and I put them both on. I bake them, don't put any oil in them or anything. I've got two plates out, one for me, one for the cat. And then I went, <laughs> I went upstairs and put on the Sopranos again, and um, she's sitting by the bed, and I'm in the bed, and when she's like... <laughs> This is so tragic. I was this about is... to say you're really not selling the celebrity selling lifestyle. It. Like everyone's like, know. no, Gail's out at like like celeb parties and she's like mixing with all these celebs. No, you're not. You're at home eating fish. 
she's baking cod for her cat and she's watching The Sopranos and then followed by that when she can't sleep she puts on Meet, Marry, Murder on the Crime Channel. Guess what that's about? You meet someone, you marry them, you murder them. It's not going to go down well on Tinder, is it? But I mean, are you are you looking for some? Well, not looking for somebody, but are you? Would you like to meet someone? Of course, I think everybody yeah. would, but they can't move in. Why can't they move in? <laughs> because I don't want them to. I don't want anyone in my space. I don't even like my no, friends staying okay. very often. But you know, what? I think the best relationships are the ones where, you know, I went out with someone a long time ago, and it was one of my favorite relationships ever. And um, but because he was away a lot, I was away a lot. And then when you got together, it was great. But then you had your own space. Was this Keith? Maybe. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it just worked and it was great. Um, I think space spent. is important, though. Yeah. And the thing is, with me having insomnia, I'm up and wandering around. I remember once I went out with this guy for not very long and I'd stayed at his mum and dad's house. And, of course, I get up in the middle of the night, put the washing machine on, and the mum comes down and she went, what the feck are you doing? And I was like, oh, God, sorry, because like, I'll just do it in my own house. <laughs> I'll just forget. Yeah, it's like 3 a.m. Oh, I'll just put the washing on, I'll get up. I won't hoover because there's a lady downstairs. So, yeah. But, um, but yeah, and I'll put the telly on, get a hot water bottle, make a cup of tea. <laughs> Sounds so good to me. Yeah, so annoying. But I'm so used to it now. I've been on my own for so long, and the cat just follows me around the house. It's like I've got you, a dog. Do you get interest when you're out? No. Really? Everyone wants to be your mate. No, I don't think so. You, do you think um, it's people, because of who you are, do you think people might be afraid to go, oh, I can't go and talk to Gail Porter? Not really. I think it's probably because I'm in the Admiral Duncan. And there's tons <laughs> of gay guys in there. Yeah, you're probably not going to pick I'm up in on Compton's. that. You never know, you might. I don't know, I'm in Compton's. So that's great fun. So I get loads of chat, but I get loads of gossip mostly. Gossip, cuddles, that's great for me. Um, I don't really go to many places, to be honest. I go to the same sort of places for lunch. Yeah. Like for lunch, you know, if I'm meeting a friend or something, we all seem to go to the same places. Maybe I should mix up. And also, I don't really go out after 8 p.m. Wow, you rock and roll child, you. I know. But the thing is, I just think, oh, can I be bothered? Um, sometimes I'll go out, but, you know, I think, you know, I don't know. It's just getting in the tube and then getting home late and... <laughs> I don't and then like you just want a cup of tea in your pyjamas. Exactly. And I just think, oh, but it's just, yeah, the whole idea of being out, out is great fun. But it's the idea of getting home, getting on the tube, walking down the dark streets on your own. And I just don't like it. Or, and then if you get a taxi, it's going to cost you about 40 quid for where I live. And I just think that's quite a lot of money after everything else you've done. It really is. But yeah, if it's a good, good um, occasion and I'm up for it, then yeah. And also I hate getting dressed up and I always wear trainers. What's wrong with that? Well, I've got a lot of friends that get really dressed up and they can wear heels and stuff. And they do this and that. So, um, yeah. Well, I just, if they want to do hello, that. Hello, everyone up there. <laughs> <laughs> dressed like a small boy with tits. Excuse me. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like in this, by the way, I, I should say, I feel like in this in this um, like chat today, we, we've talked about pretty much everything. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about that we still actually haven't properly talked about is mental health. And I think oh, right. it's, it's a big thing to me. Well, the, re the only reason being is because, and not just because it's almost like it's the only thing that people talk to you about is mental health, Gail Porter. Um, but I think because a lot of the conversations that I have with other people is focused a lot around mental health and guidance around mental health. Um, I mean, you talk about bipolarity and you talk about sort of becoming aware of, of that and, and then not initially going... What that I've been is. told I've got bipolar one, bipolar two. I've been called to uh, borderline personality. I've been told there's absolutely nothing wrong with me, and I've been told I just need more sleep. Wow! I don't know. And so this I, is by presumably by many different doctors. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was for the documentary. So there was I don't know what if, what they kept in, but yeah, I literally had plenty of them saying, "No, nah, you're totally fine," and then other people going, "No, nah, you got bipolar. No, you should be taking this. You should be taking that. No, I would prescribe you this." And I was like, my God, if I took everything that you all prescribed me, I'd be off my head even more than I already am. And that's just natural. Well, I, th I thought that the honest thing about the interview, about the, the documentary, was that it wasn't, it wasn't you trying to paint mental health in a certain aspect. It was, this is my perspective of my mental health. This is yeah. what I went through. 
it's not to say that everybody goes through the, or experiences it in the same way, but I thought that the compassionate thing about it was when you walked away from the program, you had a newfound appreciation of your journey in particular. But I, at the same time, it's 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 hard to watch. It's it's a it's a hard watch because you you realize. I mean, from my perspective, it's probably different. I know you. So having known you and then having known that you've gone through all of those things, it's quite it's quite hard to, to watch. For yourself now, Sorry. in terms of how you deal with mental health and with when you have moments of I cannot cope at the moment, what what methods do you use in order to get you through it? Well, as I say, the past as I say, a couple of weeks ago, I was usually I'll get up and even if I feel like I can't run, I'll walk. But then, yeah, the other time, a couple of weeks back, I just thought, I can't even, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to explain myself to anybody. Um, I didn't even want to get in the shower, but I'll make myself get up, get dressed, and I think, right, do I actually have to leave the house? And I know in my head I, I should do, but also I know in my head if I'm not in... Every, people know when I'm not right because I'm usually chatty and da 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 and I don't want to burst into tears in front of somebody, so I'll just sit in the house and think, okay, I'll either put music on that's not depressing or I'll put on something that makes me laugh on the telly or um, don't write anything. Don't write anything <laughs> because I'll probably... Look... But some, I mean, sometimes it's good. I've read some of the, my old stuff back that when I was not well, really not well, and it's quite a hard read, but I'm glad I kept some of it. And I'm I'm quite upset that I threw quite a lot of it away because now I look back and I think, I understand why I threw it away because I was in such a bad state. I didn't want to think about it. But now I think, oh, I wish I'd kept that. That's quite interesting. But yeah, usually I'm up and I'm out and I'll force myself to go for a run or do something. But also I'm not very good at phoning people because I get... I don't like it. And my friends know this. If I don't answer the phone, it's either I'm busy or I've put it on silent. Yeah. But if my phone's off for a couple of days, then yeah, sometimes I'll uh, put the phone back on again. I've got all these messages going, just text us. You don't have to phone us. I go, yeah, I'm not going to do anything silly, but they just want to make sure they always go, we're always here. I'm yeah. never going to do anything silly, but sometimes I just feel really tired and I just think I can't speak and I can't, but Nine times out of ten, I'll be up and I'll be out. And if I really don't want to speak to people, I'll just put like the hat way down. <laughs> well, you, did, down. you did something recently, and I thought it was it showed a great level of your own awareness about what was going on for you personally. So we had a really lovely night out, like I say, and we met some of your friends, and it was really awesome. And at one point, I turned to one of your friends and went, "Where's Gail, Where's Gail gone?" And Gail gone. had gone. And I thought at the time, I was like, oh, God, I hope you're okay. But then I afterwards, when I chatted to you afterwards, and you just kind of went, I'd, I'd, got, I'd had a moment. I just had a moment where I was like, I, I just need to leave now. And I thought, actually, just having that awareness in yourself, just being able to go, yeah, that's fine. I need to leave now. I'm done. And also, it's the fuss as well, because cause I got everyone together, and then I think if I say goodbye to one person, everyone's going to get, and I was getting so, I thought, right, do you know what? I've been here for five hours and everyone, it's been lovely and everyone's had drinks and everyone's got to meet each other. And when everyone was chatting to each other, I just went out with my friends, you know, James and, and Todd, his husband, and um, they just went, right. And I said, just apologise, but thank everybody. And do you know what? Nobody even said anything. My friends were just going, lovely, you okay? I was like, fine, I'm sorry. They went, no, I need to apologise. Yeah. That's. I was like, fine, sorry about that. But I had to go. I just had to go. Don't know why. Well, there was were, a whole you okay? were you okay afterwards? Yeah, yeah, it was totally fine. I just was getting tired. And then I was thinking about, you know, mum um, and dad and just just weird things started to come into my mind. And people were talking about partners and da-da-da. And I was just, I don't know. I Sometimes I just go, right, that's great. I'm really, really happy, but I, I need to go now because I feel a bit... I'm overwhelmed, happily overwhelmed, but sometimes you just say, I don't want to be that person that bursts in tears because people are going, are you happy? Are you sad? Because sometimes I burst in tears because I'm happy. and But then you have to explain yourself and I don't want to explain myself. And I just think, I know now, it's time to go. And uh, I don't want to fuss and thanks for coming. I'll speak to you later. <laughs> I'm just not going to tell you that I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, at the same time. You can, and also preserving everyone around me from a scene. <laughs> 
Well, no, but I mean, I guess like in terms of work, you can be professional in the work like yeah, set, yeah, yeah. sets and you and you do what's required of you, etc. You know, you you smile and you you dance, etc. For when you're with your friends, you can take your guard down, and can. then I think yeah. that's quite. I mean, it's the best thing in the world, but also it's quite emotionally. It's so brilliant because you're just going oh, and then you get tired. And you just think oh, that was perfect and the perfect timing perfect time to go and just think um, that's the best time but I need to go now do, do you feel though that you can take your guard down I mean now that in terms of like publicly people know the, like the struggles that you've experienced and the press more importantly know the struggles you've experienced do you feel now that you can let your guard down knowing that there will be some degree of I know from a from a media point of view, some sort of acceptance almost. Yeah, I think so. I think um, also the, the strangest. I mean, I don't go anywhere that exciting. That's, that I can take really my guard down, and unless it's like it's Sainsbury's or something. Woo. Um, but no, I don't really go anywhere very exciting. But also, I think the press. Do you know what? It's a, it's a hard one because I don't really want to get into it because I don't think they'll ever be particularly nice because after you know the Caroline Flack thing and everyone was just you know what just leave her alone and then the press it got a really hard time which was completely deserved and um but then they still pick on people yeah you, you need to you know because when, when I can't sleep I, I read through all the papers because I'm always interested because it'll go you know all the tabloids will go oh, we've got an exclusive on this and then another one's got an exclusive and it's a completely different story and different sort of, and I just think it's so weird only because I've grown up in this industry and I've had all sorts of shit written about me and then but yet they'll go no we're going to be kind we're going to be kind and then they've got a picture of someone going look how fat she's got or look and oh my god yeah. let's phone Gail up and see what she's got to say about Will Smith hitting someone like I know what it's like to hit somebody oh but because there's someone that's alopecia involved then obviously it's something that you've got to comment on we just leave them alone it's you know it's done now I think the entire world's seen it just don't think and go on about it do, do yet, you still feel though that the press do yeah, that yeah, with definitely. you but I yeah. think sometimes I, I think I don't know if they're a, a little bit weirded out about upsetting me because of my past troubles do you know what? I'm not sure if they just think maybe she's a bit too fragile to be picked on um I don't know but also I don't really go anywhere for them to say anything much about it's nothing very exciting yeah. to say so um but yeah because in the 90s there was just people everywhere there's paper there's cameras everywhere paparazzi's everywhere and that's obviously what I found out because our phones were all being you know hacked so they all knew where we were whoever we were whether it was like Madonna was doing something around the corner or some Z list of like Gail's going to budgeons they they seemed to know and it was just weird because I used to walk my dog and once I clicked clocked on that there was these guys just following me every day and I've got honey my daughter attached to my front she was a wee bit baby not like a 19 year old that just looked weird but anyway she says actually and I've got my dog Missy pulling me along and I, and then once I, they were there every single day and I was just like how boring is this and so eventually I thought do you know what I'm, I'm gonna have a dog walking outfit so I'd wear the have my outfit do my walk around Primrose Hill or wherever we went, Hampstead Heath, and then come home, wash it, hang it out to dry, put it on the next day. And then it was about five days later, one of the photographers went, you've had the same outfit on all day. And I went, and? And he went, well, we've just got the same picture every day. And I was like, and? And they went, oh, we see what you're doing. I was like, well, just F off, because I'm going to keep wearing the same clothes and it looks like you're doing the same picture. So could you just let me walk the dog with a tiny baby and just leave me alone? You've heard about the magic scarf, haven't you? No. So someone... Does it make in, you invisible? Well, somebody in the States, I don't know who it is, but they've created this scarf that celebrities now have started wearing around their necks. And when you have a camera flash, it reflects off the scarf and it blacks out the face so you can't actually take a photograph of the Ooh, person is that a real thing or is did you it's make a it real up? thing you can actually buy them did you hear did you hear about the invisible friend go on so when you get on a train right you don't want to sit beside someone because you get anxious yeah. you take two bottles of water you take two books and then you sit on a two-seater that's not got it says available available and then you sit your bottle of water and a book on the, that side and then my side is that side and then it looks like they've gone to the toilet that's not a bad suggestion, actually. I yeah, might do that next time, actually. Yeah, and because I've got two pairs of glasses, one for 
regular outdoors and one for reading i put a pair of glasses in the next seat so there's two pairs of glasses and my invisible friend's just gone to the toilet so next you one if you see gail porter on a train yeah. with just three left. bottles of water then you know that she just doesn't want you to sit next to her <laughs> <laughs>